So the rare moment I'm not working on a record, podcast, or a marketing plan, I'm often on the phone with some of my friends in the music business. A weird thing happened this past week when I was talking to three different friends who work in either A&R or marketing at big indie labels with top tier artists. They were all complaining about the exact same thing, which shockingly doesn't happen very often. But the funny thing was, they were all complaining about what they agreed is the most effective marketing tool possibly in the history of music. One would think they'd be thrilled that they have access to what we are all seeing as one of the biggest opportunities to blow up a musician's fan base ever, yet they were pretty annoyed about it. So this video, I'm going to explain to you what the opportunity in marketing is and why these music business suit types are so annoyed and how you can use it to your advantage. Hi, I'm Jesse Cannon, a music marketing nerd who's teaching musicians how to grow their fan base from zero to 10,000 fans. And this is Museformation. So I know what you're thinking. It's not like me to veil all this mystery in a video and not just come out and start barking my thoughts at you. But I think a proper setup sometimes gives a little bit more of a payoff. And despite the fact that I've been really trimming down and hitting the gym lately, think of me as Santa Claus and you being the kid wanting to receive their gift. Okay, so let's let the cat out of the bag a little. For the past five to seven years, I don't think you could find anyone who really has their head in the music business who would disagree that getting a good playlist placement is the greatest marketing opportunity to ever exist for artists both big and small to grow a fan base very fast for the amount of money it costs, which really is the price of 30 to 60 minutes of labor usually, and how huge that payoff can be is unequaled. And yes, we could go on and on about how these fans from playlists aren't engaged all the time and building a fan base takes more than just playlists, but let's be real. The artists who do figure out how to engage them and build off the opportunity have never had a marketing opportunity quite as egalitarian and low on cost when you could put in very little work and get huge opportunities with a small budget and by simply having a good song really bubble up to the top. It's unprecedented. It would take a real contrarian to argue this, and I know I'm basically inviting this in the comments, so type away, virgin. Okay, but I'll be honest, I'm not so thrilled with the direction of a lot of the big playlists are going, since there's a trajectory I see in the music business over and over again in all the years I've been watching it, is that a new tool comes out that really flattens the playing field between DIY artists and those on the big labels. And in time, it always goes back to the big labels asserting their influence and opportunities and squishing down the DIY and smaller indie artists, and they start to diminish. And sadly, I'm seeing that in playlists now. Now, many of the playlists I follow have more DIY artists and small indies than ever, and the editors really do have an egalitarian editorial policy that doesn't seem to be overly influenced by the majors. But many of the playlists that are bigger with a really huge audience seem to be becoming nothing but the boosters of the biggest indies and majors, with little exception. And that's a bummer. Now I'm not going to say all hope is lost, in fact if anything I still see tons of small artists that I work with getting on playlists that help them build a fan base. But I'd also be lying if I didn't see a trend I don't love of big label power really starting to take up all the oxygen in the room. But as I was just promising a minute or so ago, me and my colleagues in the business are seeing an even bigger marketing opportunity than playlists that is immune to the big indies and majors taking over that literally every artist on a big label won't shut the f up about and is making my label friends totally miserable. That opportunity is what I'm calling artist page visibility. Here's what I mean. Ever since Spotify started showing the artists on features, remixes, and split releases on the artists they're paired with page, this has become the greatest awareness tool for an artist ever. It is literally a cosign on the greatest real estate in music marketing history. As you can see on the screen now, here's a few examples of an artist being featured on another artist page. Not only can fans hear the artist on the song and enjoy it, they can see who it is and with one click explore if they would like to go deeper with that artist and become a fan. And if you're failing to see why this is possibly the biggest marketing opportunity in the history of music, think of it like this. When have you ever had someone in the mood to listen to music and while they're vibing and loving a record, they can look down as they wonder what to listen to next and as they just had a great experience listening to a record and are in the mood for it, they see another artist who is involved with that great experience right there staring at them, pretty much begging them to get a click and keep the vibe going. If you think of it this way, I know tons of you love to spend your money on Facebook ads. You think they're an effective use of your money, but no Facebook ad catches someone while they are listening to music in the very player and puts a name and suggestion into the mind of a listener, like hearing that artist on a song they like and the invitation to explore more is right in front of them. That's unprecedented, and it exists on the artist page, the album page, or single page of the song, and 
any playlist that song is added to, which makes it explosive. Since if the song gets added to a big playlist, it is there giving visibility and breeding familiarity with the artist's name. And since we all know it takes fans four to eight times of seeing a name before they explore who it is, this is crucial. And for the simple investment of working out a collaboration deal between the artists, this is an insane marketing opportunity that now exists for everyone. And here's the other big reason this is so huge. It's forever. So much music marketing is so temporary, it's like actually depressing these days. But for as long as the artist is relevant and getting listens, that artist's name on their page and on their collaboration is there. But let's look at what this looks like today. For many artists, it's just doing features or collabs. You write the song together or sing on it, and then it's credited together as long as you do the tagging right in your upload. Obviously, remixes getting tagged as an artist is huge, and many labels and management now target producers that are similar to their artists to do remixes, as this effectively gets their artist on that artist page, and remixes were always effective marketing, but now are bigger than ever with artist page visibility. This is why you are seeing a huge resurgence of artists doing remix records again. After that trend had slowed down for years, it is ramping back up and it effectively gets a whole new life for a record as people see the artist name pop up on the other artist page and can juice streaming numbers immensely for them as well as monthly listeners. But it's not even just remixes that are trending. One of the things I've seen recently is collab releases where two artists team up for a whole collab release. As I was writing the script, I was actually banging one, as I have been for weeks. Glaive is an artist I've been on about since before he even had 100,000 streams. But Eric Doa never did it for me. But after cranking their collab EP record for a week, a funny thing happened, and I'm now jamming Eric Doa more than I do Glaive's solo work, and I'm all in on him now. But even smaller cosigns are happening more and more. I mean, Phoebe Bridgers just signed a group I really enjoy called Muna to her label, and sure enough, they now have a collab between the two of them where they could do some audience expansion with one another. But let's also talk about how this works in a more rock orientated world where having someone else sing on your song and doing collabs with other producers is not really the vibe. I think of how effective this was back when I was a wee lad and into punk rock records. Bands would constantly release split 7 inches or 12 inches. I mean, I literally bought hundreds of these, where one side would be one artist and the other another artist that they were friends with. And this is how I would discover a lot of my favorite groups. Both of their fan bases would buy these as they toured across the country, sometimes separately, sometimes together, and in turn spread the word about both artists, and they'd exist in record stores where people would buy it because they see the one artist they like and then discover a new artist. It is definitely argued that some bands who did less promo and touring got popular on the backs of just doing these split releases with artists who were actually out there touring their asses off. But these releases didn't usually involve the artists playing one another's songs since I know a lot of you are not so into having other artists on your songs. And listen, I get it. I actually don't really love in rock when some other singer comes into the song out of nowhere. It kind of kills the vibe for me like 99% of the time. But doing split releases where you team up to spread awareness with one another dates back all the way to the punk scene of the 80s, and this is now an effective marketing method you can now do to effectively trade audiences with like-minded members of your community. But I want to show the dynamics of this some more. I think of the genius of 100 Gex breakout record 1000 Gex. There was a pretty genius move in their tagging since both Laura Less and Dylan Brady of the group make their own solo material and produce songs, so they tagged their artist pages individually, which set up tons of visibility for both of them as their own artists. Even though when they came on the scene no one had any clue who the two of them were, except under the moniker of 100 Gex, it gave visibility to their previous work and set them up to spread their future work even bigger as that record has such long legs and is still being talked about so much years later. I then think of like the producer Blood Pop, who I have no idea how when he first came on the scene convinced Justin Bieber to allow him to be a featured artist as a producer on the song Friends, but this crosses over to his profile because he's tagged on it and does big things for him. By the way, if this video is giving you value, please like, subscribe, and get notified, as this is what we talk about here, and you definitely don't want to miss a video. So I know some of you are skeptical of what I say, so let me put this in perspective. My friend who's a product manager, aka like a marketing person at one of the biggest electronic music labels, says she now spends 75% of her time securing and negotiating features and remix, and that literally is the majority of her marketing budget is now that, since they see that money is spent better than music videos or anything else, they've actually shrunk the budgets for outdoor and print ads in favor of features and remixes. That's how in on this labels are now. 
So why are the label employees mad about this? You're probably wondering since I brought that up. Well, it requires them to do work that has an actionable result. When the artists are saying who can we do collabs with or remixes or split releases, it's something the label actually has to deliver on and do for them. And we all know, well, if you've ever been on a label, you know that's not always their favorite thing to have to do actionable work. They have to do work and brainstorm, and let's be honest, this is tough work convincing people to do things. They'd rather do other work than having to ask managers and label reps to link and build all day. So I know some of you are thinking, what the fuck, Jesse? This channel is all about marketing yourself for those of us who don't have 10,000 fans yet. This doesn't seem like you. Let me yet again point to one of my most important videos in this curriculum on marketing your music. It's my video on how you find community. This teaches you how to find the similar artists to you to do collabs, remixes, features, or split releases with. It's linked on the screen now or in the description below. It is truly must watch material in one of my most important videos. And I want to be straight with you on how you do this effectively. Don't set your sights too big and just approach huge artists. That's not actually how this gets done. If you find like-minded artists who are working hard, this is an investment of both of your future growth. And let's be honest, fans gravitate towards communities where they feel they could potentially belong. And linking and building and doing something with another artist demonstrates that community and can be a great investment in gaining more fans. Doing collabs in any of these forms can grow your fan base, no matter how big the artist is, as long as those artists are going to continue to grow, since once you do this growth, your growth and their growth is tethered to one another, and that's exactly what makes this such a huge marketing opportunity. Okay, that's about enough of me going on and on. If you have thoughts, feelings, etc., leave it in the comments, and please like and subscribe and get notified, since this is what we discuss here.